Hey, good morning, all, or at least uh, the five of you that have jumped on already this morning. <laughs> uh, good to have you today. It's good to be back. Uh, feeling a little better this week, so that's a good thing. That was a um, bit of a rough week last week, so glad to be turning the corner on, on uh, physical health. Um, for those of you who are on early and kind of ramping up, I want to just give you something to reflect on as we get going today. And then I'll mention it later as well, <clears throat> so other people can maybe just give some thought to this a little bit today as we gather together. And that is, I want you to kind of, if you can, when you have a little bit of wiggle room in this presentation, you know, whether you're zoning out or, uh, you know, there's a pause moment, to sort of think about a time or, or remember a moment when you had an experience that felt like it drew you into a degree of solidarity with another person or a situation or e even an experience, you know, whether it be the arts or nature or um, an event, you know, what, what was it in your mind if you think about that experience that, that opened you up to feeling like you were kind of uh, there's an old religious term called atonement, which means to be at one with, you know, that you felt not just intellectually engaged or that you were a part of something, but you felt this almost like existential weight of oneness with the experience itself. And I, and I bring that up today because I, I want to try to get to a place today to push beyond the idea of, um, you know, thinking about religion as an exercise and using some of the material today to just pose the question about as we think about constructing common life together on the tail end of this virus, we can only hope, <laughs> you know, how can we do it that allows for um, a heightened degree of kind of empathetic solidarity. And, uh, and that's, so, that's what I want to uh, think about today. So for those of you who popped on early, you get a little bit of a taste of that. That's where we're headed today. And uh, for those of you who are jumping on board, um, whether you view this in real time and are shouting out to each other and trying to build a kind of um, solidarity or a, a connection with others today on Facebook Live, or whether you're joining us during the week, um, just to give you a chance to kind of feel like you're connected not to a um, what I would think of as like a, a well thought out expression of a religious experience because that's not what this is going to be for a while but sort of some reflections that have come up for me as I took this time of, of sabbatical over the last few months trying to tend to ways in which people uh, construct meaning and connection in their lives given the context we're in and the world that we now occupy how do people do that and then how does that find its way into our shared life as a small religious community out here in the west coast so that's what I'm working on <clears throat> all right so uh, welcome take a deep breath and let's get you know let's get rolling um, I think one of the things that's happened for us in this uh, moment is because the pandemic has required for the past year for all of us to put on hold many of the religious practices that we had grown used to. So we had to put them on the shelf for a while because we couldn't engage in that level of community together. And that's given us a time to sort of um, put some distance between our patterns that we had grown used to and the sort of dependencies that we create in relationship to those patterns, right? That I, maybe I always go to church on a Sunday morning or I, I love to do this, that, or the other thing on a Sunday morning. We created these rhythms prior to the pandemic. We had to separate from those rhythms. And so my, my invitation to you is to think about how do we then um, think about or strategize ways to re-engage that don't just fall back into the old patterns but learn something from the experience we've had now seeking 
spirituality or groundedness or connection with others in this new way? And what did we learn along the way? And today I hope to migrate our sense that I have that we really have a longing to be uh, together, to gather together with others, that that is really one of the heartbeats of what it means to be uh, whole or, con or, or connected to the spirit of life is that we do that collectively. You know, we're connected to each other, we're connected to the natural world, uh, we're connected to our own uh, personal history and, and, and present moment. This sense of sort of being in your body, being embodied or being enfleshed in the moment with others is a critical thing that I see people longing for in so many different ways. And I talked about that last week. So, but how do we move that to a level that is, um, that kind of um, gives our life shape or, or texture or uh, nuance or capacity is what I wanna explore a little bit today as well. Um, I think one of the trend lines in most religions, and, and you can find it in any religion, so it's not like Christianity has, the, has anything up on any other religion or, or religious system on this, but for many religions, there is this aspect to their tradition that is actually intended to push the participant beyond the tradition itself. Does that make sense? Let me repeat that. There is in the buried, like treasure, <laughs> inside so many religious systems, that the point is not to settle into this comfortable place where you're part of a religious system, but the religious system itself has components that push you beyond itself into something different or more mysterious, maybe, you might think of. Uh, you see it in Buddhism, right? The, the point of Buddhism is not to somehow um, uh, spend time worshiping or, or paying attention to the Buddha. The point of Buddhism is to find your own Buddha consciousness, right? To, to find this way of being that is, you know, like the Buddha, right? So uh, there's that old line in Buddha that I love, one of the koans is if you see the Buddha in the road, you know, if you've objectified the Buddha and that's your goal and you're finding like, there he is, I've arrived, I've, I've met the Buddha, the whole goal of, in that moment is to run the Buddha over, right? To, to move past the Buddha self to Buddha consciousness. And, and uh, there's all sorts of terms for that that I can't remember because it's too early in the morning, but that's the point or one of the points of the religious experience. The same in Christianity. Uh, there is at the heart of Christianity a push beyond the construct of Christianity itself to be, um, uh, to be at one with Christ, to be Christ-like, to, to embody or enflesh the spirit of the living Christ or the, or the way of Jesus, right? That, that becomes a part of who you are. You are moving beyond just a religious construct into something more deep and mysterious and open. And that's, that's available to everybody, I think, inside of uh, so many religious experiences. Uh, I see it even in the way in which uh, you think about Taoism and Confucianism, right? Confucianism is, feels, feels really rule-based and, and there's all this kind of heavy construct and how we will behave together. And then it births itself at one period in time into the, into the way of, the, of Taoism, which is much more poetic and open and artistic, you know, it's pulling you through a construct to the other side. And there's so many of us get stuck in the construct, right? You say, well, you know, um, someone would ask you if you're religious, you say, well, yeah, I'm, um, you know, a Lutheran. I attend this church, right? And we stop, we got to stop it there. And that's fine, but there is more. And part of me feels like, this time we have has given us an opportunity to think about how do we, how do we move into the more of it all? And, and maybe how do we move into that together? 
things are beeping. Um, yeah, I apologize for it's a couple of little side notes here. Um, obviously, I'm here at my table at home, my dining room table, which is a very small dining room table. And uh, we're replacing our front door, so there's no front door. So you're going to hear traffic and possibly the dogs barking. It's the whole immersive experience into what is, you know, my current life with Lori here at home. Um, I think tending to this question, then um, it poses a couple things. Let me, let me just take an example from the life of Jesus. And this is going to happen in John's Gospel that we're going to look at today when we gather together. For those of you who gather together at the 11 o'clock service, <clears throat> John's Gospel, Jesus has this crazy line in John's Gospel um, that the followers of Jesus are trying to imagine what life might be like without a dependency upon the religion in which they were born and raised. And they've been following this Jesus around long enough and living life within Jewish synagogue that there is this split that happens and they're starting to get pushed out of the synagogues in John's Gospel. There's a big conflict going on. And they're anxious. I'm sure they're anxious about, well, how do we do religion, Jesus, without the religion, <laughs> without all that? stuff that we've come to trust in and, and count on and depend in. And, uh, and Jesus is trying to get them to see that they're, in a sense, to take on his life almost like they consume nourishment, like they eat bread or drink wine, right? And he says to them, you, you must um, eat my body and you must drink my blood. And, and the followers are like, what are you talking about? I mean, they just don't get it. And I think what Jesus is pushing them in that particular context is to say, look, you, you have to enflesh the spirit that I'm tapping into here. That's your journey forward. How do you tap into that spirit and embody it and enflesh it in your own way, in your own unique style, is what this journey is about. It's not about... Uh, adhering to a religious construct. So let go of that a little bit and, and live. It's like an invitation to, um, to life itself. And, and Jesus refers to this in this, uh, in this story that you're going to hear about today at 11 in saying, you know, if you, religion is like bread that rots. That's what he says. Uh, bread that you eat and you're just going to get hungry again. But when you, when you, open up your spirit to this different kind of way of being, that's, that's nourishment forever, right? That's eternal nourishment, and that's a comparison he makes. I'll unpack that a little bit uh, today at the 11 o'clock service for those of you who you attend. So, uh, where do we go from here? How much? Yeah, we're going fine. Just a couple of stories that might help, and I've invited those of you who are participating to think about stories too, because this might be a way to enter into this kind of space that I want to explore, and that is stories that, um, that you remember that were experiences that drew you into sort of a deepened solidarity with another or an experience. You think about that. And I'm going to give you a couple examples just from my own experience and one recent one. Um, the first one was, I was up at seminary, and I was, um, I can't remember why I was there, and I have to admit, I, did, I don't really like going back to seminary anymore because, um, you know, there's just so many trappings of, of what I thought was important to religion at the time when I was in seminary that are still up there and a part of that system, and I'm really trying to push myself, if I can, as a, a spiritual person, you know, kind of push through that a little bit. But I'm there and I'm and I'm talking to a new student. And I've shared this story before and I was sharing some of my life story and she was supposed to share hers as a one-on-one -on -one time. And in the in the middle of that conversation she used a phrase that caught me off guard. As I was as she was sharing I would say, "Yeah, I hear you. You know, I hear you." This was the language I would use. But when I was sharing uh, she would say, yeah, I feel you. 
Yeah, I feel you. And at first it caught me off guard, and so I had her unpack that a little bit. And I could tell that she was listening to my story, not with the intent of accumulating or recording or even remembering the, the information of my story, but she was listening to my story in a way that connected to her heart and her soul, right? She was feeling my story. She wasn't just hearing my story. Something about her life experience allowed her to listen to me in a way that I don't normally get listened to. And the more we got into this sharing, the more I could feel sort of this emotional um, like connectivity with this person that I don't normally experience when I'm just telling my life story to just any, anybody, right? She had, some, she had something inside of her that was open to where she could feel my story. And that's always stuck with me. Like, why, why is it that we tend to interpret all these stories in our head or as an accumulation of information and not this deeper feeling level? And so all of us know a little bit of what that's like. I remember um, when Trump got elected and there was the birthing of the Me Too movement was kind of happening at the time. And, and all of us were trying to come to grips with what um, some of the issues were around the Me Too movement. And I was reading articles and I was trying to understand it the best I could. I was looking at my own personal history and the way in which I had constructed relationships with um, women in my life and had I been oppressive in some way, have, have I been holding them back, you know, all those things, you know, you're just kind of wrestling with all that in your head. And then I got invited um, by the women I know and love, right, to attend the Women's March. And you, many of you remember that, it's years ago now. And I tell you, you know, it didn't move because it was there were so many people you couldn't actually march. But I was down in the one in Oakland and um, even saw some of you down there. And the massive amount of energy held and articulated by the women who were predominant in that crowd helped me to get in touch with that experience of all the that was being uh, articulated, shared, expressed in that movement, the women's movement at that time, I experienced it at a completely different level, right? Being a faceless entity in this huge crowd of energy was a different kind of experience. I needed to be together, but that togetherness was inviting me into an awareness level that was um, beyond what I can normally do in my brain or in, or, you know, with, um, you know, on my own. And that was just this palpable, powerful moment to where I, I felt more of the existential solidarity with the movement and the experience than just a participant in a march. Now I have to admit to you, I have a hard time finding language or words to describe what that is. I have a even harder time um, when I think about those issues, thinking about them from that point of view, right? So how do I get in touch with that <laughs> rather than thinking about, you know, the experience itself? That's, that's, I'm struggling with that a little bit, but I think that's a little bit the essence of what I'm talking about. And, and partly what I think is what I would love to see us explore how to do collaboratively as a little congregation in Lafayette and as people connected on the internet, you know, whatever it happens to be. So that's, that's one experience. The second one um, happened at a table like this. I'm at a small table right now. It's a table for four people. You know, it's not super big because, you know, what happens at this table and many tables is you know, people come over for dinner and you sit down, you share a meal, but mostly you're uh, connecting with one another, hearing stories, learning about lives, 
trying to both listen and understand someone and feel their life story. You know, that happens around a table together. So tabling, you know, like if you think about the open table, that's what open table's all about, right? It's not just about consumption, it's about connection. It's about unity, oneness, what, you know, being one body together. That's, you, you know all the metaphorical language that falls uh, on top of a table. And clearly, um, even in most religious systems, there is some form of tabling that happens that invites you into that. So this one's connected to my experience of uh, Black Lives Matter movement. And um, like you, I'll, I, I can't ever forget the explosion of that movement, in particular, the way in which the spark of that movement seemed to, to ignite most fully in the loss of George Floyd in his murder at the um, hands of a police officer. And I remember that moment so vividly, right? It was, it was such a tragic moment. The, the pain of that moment was so big that it motivated both me and others to try to explore issues of, um, you know, our own, Im, you know, internal biases and, and tendencies towards um, racist systems and thinking. And, you know, I spent some time with others and continue to try to explore what that means to me. I was dealing with it like we talk about, you know, trying to understand it. And I also remember pretty clearly that um, George Floyd's family uh, particularly Terrence Floyd, was thrown into the spotlight. And I remember watching some of the videos of him and his body in these news conferences w would literally begin to shake. And I'm like, wow, I, don't, I can't even connect with the feeling he must be having about not only the loss of his brother, which is like super tragic, right? but also the weight of all the kind of global awareness around his, his brother's death and murder, and then the explosion of this global movement around, well, hey, everybody, you know, black lives matter. How do we turn the tide on, you know, all this history of racism embedded in so many ways systemically, um, both culturally and, and, and even internally? Watching him and paying attention to him at that moment was, um, you know, palpable. So I've been doing that work for a while. And we, on sabbatical, we took a time to go to New York City with Arden and Susan. And we went to a jazz club. And um, we had a front table at the jazz club right in front of the musical group. And unbeknownst to me and everybody else at the table, sitting right next to us at that table of the jazz club was Terrence Floyd, George Floyd's brother. I mean, he's literally just two feet away from me and all the people in, in that space for us, you know, this, but we did, we didn't recognize, I didn't recognize him. Um, he was just another person at that moment uh, in this jazz club. And then towards the end of the set, the musician said, hey, I, um, he started actually choking up and saying, I wrote this piece um, to honor George Floyd and the whole movement that started around uh, George Floyd's murder. And he invited a Terrence up onto the stage with him. And because we were at his table and so close, you know, he had to move, you know, right by it. You could just feel him. And the whole room could feel him. And then the music sustained that feeling as he stood on stage quietly as this band did this tribute piece to honor his brother and the whole movement that happened from black, you know, this Black Lives Matter movement. It, it was one of the more palpable, explosive events I've had personally in a long time, right? That was a moment when there, there wasn't like we were going to talk about this issue. <laughs> it was a moment when you're invited to feel this issue in a different way, to be present for this issue in a way that 
I think literally changes something in your DNA or in your physiology. And after it was over and he came down and the whole night came to a close, you know, um, Susan talked to him for a minute, I talked to him for a minute. And then while we were struggling to find words, he had his hand on my shoulder and Susan's shoulder as we were standing there for a while. And it, it almost felt like, um, like time stood still. And I will tell you that for the, for in that moment, I understood a little bit more what kind of solidarity feels like. I, I couldn't find any language to describe how I felt, but the degree of his pain and experience in his physical presence was, um, you know, it's just something I'm never going to forget. Now, now what I say I was, um, there was a moment of atonement, a moment when I was at one with George Floyd's brother. I, I, I don't know that I would say that, but I, but I would say it was an edge towards that. Right? It was this is this like um, opening that I hadn't, I, I don't normally have, right? So the question that that raised up for me is when we think about how we are to be together as we figure out ways to reunite as a community post pandemic, are there ways for us to feel each other? And, 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 not, and to move beyond feeling like I'm connected to the, just the life of Jesus or the Buddha or Mohammed or whatever prophetic voice you're listening to, but, but they, they entered into this compassionate space because they had experienced some sort of a deep and abiding solidarity with the people in their time, right? It was the Buddha who moved out from the protected space of the confines of privilege into the life of suffering that realized um, this um, compassionate engagement with the world that created the Buddha. Jesus, too, moves out of kind of the construct of time into fishing villages and people who are diseased. And he's, it's that connectivity that's sparking what we've now constructed as the religious experience. Uh, and the same with Muhammad too. You could look at all these prophetic voices in all these different religious systems, and they all kind of build on this capacity for true solidarity or empathy or at one within the context in which they find themselves. And that is the fuel that drives their ability to um, to bring about compassion in the world. They're, they're not doing charity, which sometimes happens out from abundance. They're doing solidarity, right? Like, let me feel you for a minute and walk with you for a time and see if that, that connectivity brings about some kind of healing. Wow, what might that look like together? Now I'll admit to you, I don't, um, you know, I don't have the answers uh, clearly, and my hope is that we can find ways, maybe some pods of Zoom calls or something, to just um, continue to explore what that might look like as an aspect to what already is a pretty strong uh, religious institutional life that we've maintained and managed and and uh, embody in a in a site, you know, in a physical plant and structures, but but that piece seems to me like a piece we're all hungry for as well. Not just to gather, but to gather so we can we can really feel each other, you know, feel the story of another. We don't have to solve the story. We don't have to fix everything, but we can at least be present for each other and for the world and for nature and for our, uh, you know, our, all these systems that seem so uh, diseased at the moment. How do we enter into that kind of space together? So that's my pondering for today. It would have been 30 minutes for the pondering. Um, of course, I appreciate that we can have this time to do this 
in this format. And I appreciate any, you know, like thoughtful reflections you might have along the way that you can put in the chat, ideas, uh, ways of thinking about this, maybe even possibilities for how we might continue the conversation that is more conversational in style and not just me talking at you. Um, all that's in front of us, and that's a good thing. All right? So that's it for today. Um, I don't have any poetry or any um, anything like that to share with you today, but I guess my closing remarks would be for you to just go inside your own story a little bit and see if you can outline for yourself the character of a moment or two in your own life where that deep sense of at one moment or, or solidarity was a part of your experience. And if you can revisit the shape of that, how, how might that shape uh, manifest itself in, um, in common life together? Or the life that you live in relationship with all the people that you love and care for and interact with. How can you kind of remember that that tender birthing place can be a birthing moment uh, for you and others as we think about pushing beyond religion as just the maintenance of a religious system or institution and religion as being this invitation to be at one with life itself. That's the, that's the food that just keeps on feeding us. Hmm. What might that look like and feel like for us today? Amen to that. All right. Um, thanks for being a part of today. Uh, hopefully it gave you some uh, food for thought. Push on the metaphor. I also realized that I think I did something about establishing a donate button on this thing. And... Um, if it's there and you want to try it out, uh, please do. <laughs> I don't even know if it's if you can see it, but I think um, that showed up when I was setting it up. Um, goodness knows uh, we could all use the support out here. All right, all. I'll see some of you at 11. Uh, we'll see a lot of you next week. Uh, we're going to explore a little bit more of this theme next week, and then I'm going to try to come up with maybe a few ways in which we can, during the week, uh, figure out a way to do some conversation around this and then use the insights from that conversation as a part of uh, this time together too on Sunday morning for a while. All right, be well and we'll see you all soon.